would have thought that a show about a prosperous black couple who were able to move on up the socioeconomic ladder due to the success of their chain of dry cleaners would go on to become one of the longest running sitcoms in American history. But it happened. That show, which debuted on CBS on January 18th, 1975, and ran until July 2nd, 1985, was called The Jeffersons. Fun fact, Janae Dubois, who portrayed Wilona on Good Times, another Norman Lear show, and Jeff Berry co-wrote the theme song for The Jeffersons called Moving On Up. She can also be heard performing the lead vocals on the track. Moving on up, moving on up. To the Janae wanted to do more than just act, and when she approached Norman about branching out, he suggested she write the theme song for his new show. She infused it with her own story, having always dreamed of moving her mother into a deluxe apartment when she achieved success. The song also drew from black culture, styled almost as a spiritual, complete with a 35-member choir. The Jeffersons was launched as the second spin-off from All in the Family. The first was Maude. It featured married couple George and Louise Wheezy Jefferson as the neighbors of Archie and Edith Bunker. Both All in the Family and the Jeffersons were developed by famed screenwriter and producer Norman Lear. Fun fact, the idea of the Jeffersons moving on up came after several members of the political organization the Black Panthers met with Norman. They wanted to talk to him about good times. They took issue with Black people on television always being portrayed as poor. The Panthers told Norman that there were successful Black people in the world whose stories could be compelling and funny. The conversation resonated with Norman, and he began to conceive of the Jeffersons as an effort to show a Black family having real economic success and living the American dream. Creators Don Nickel, Michael Ross, and Bernie West centered the show around the Jeffersons, who were able to move from working-class Queens, New York, to posh Manhattan, New York, after George's business, Jefferson Cleaners, boomed and put them in a much higher tax bracket. The creative trio also served as executive producers. Fun fact, the role of George, played by Sherman Hemsley, was specifically created by Norman Lear for him. There was one small hitch, though. Sherman wasn't going to be able to be introduced in the first season of All in the Family as planned, since he was already starring in the Broadway musical Pearly at the time. Rather than cast someone else, Norman decided to keep George off screen until Sherman was available. Norman then created the character of Henry Jefferson, George's younger brother, played by Mel Stewart to fill in, and explained the reason George wasn't seen to be that he was uncomfortable walking into a white man's house, setting up the character as a foil for Archie's racism. George was finally introduced in the sixth episode of All in the Family's fourth season, titled Henry's Farewell. After Lionel Jefferson, played by Mike Evans, first appeared in the premiere episode of All in the Family, his mother, played by Isabel Sanford, born Eloise Gwendolyn Sanford, was introduced in the eighth episode of that season, titled Lionel Moves Into the Neighborhood, when the Jeffersons move in next door to the bunkers. The 16th episode of the fifth season of All in the Family, titled The Jeffersons Move Up, would serve as the pilot for the Jeffersons when Edith gives a tearful goodbye to Wheezy, George, and their son Lionel, and they make the big move into the luxurious Colby East, a fictional high-rise apartment complex on East 63rd Street on the Upper East Side. The Jeffersons would officially premiere the following week. Fun fact, when Isabel and Sherman learned they were going to play a couple, neither was thrilled about it. Hemsley's first meeting with Sanford did not go quite so well. Reportedly, he considered her pompous and arrogant, and she thought he was a know-it-all loudmouth bully. The, the first time I uh, met Sherman, I was coming into work. Isabel, come in. This is your new husband. My husband, he was uh, this little pipsqueak. I could sit on him and match him like a bug. She goes. <laughs> because I had to be polite. I didn't want to say, say what? Come on. Because I expected, for me, big man. For my husband, you know, big. Though the character himself didn't appear on camera, George's career as a dry cleaner began in the first season of All in the Family. His path there went a little something like this. George worked as a janitor for a large apartment building, while Wheezy worked as a housekeeper. An insurance settlement he won as a result of a car accident allowed George to quit his job and launch his first dry cleaning business. At the beginning of the series, he was operating five stores throughout New York City, with another two opening during the following seasons. Fun fact, 
Isabel had major doubts about how successful the Jeffersons would be, so much so that she didn't want to do it, preferring to stay on All in the Family. Then the casting director came to her and let her know that the network was set on moving forward with getting the show on the air and would get someone else to play Wheezy and write the character out of All in the Family altogether. That piece of information was all she needed to agree to sign on. The characters of Lionel's girlfriend and eventual wife, aspiring fashion designer Jenny, and her family were also written into the new series. However, the roles were all recast, with Berlinda Tolbert taking over the role of Jenny, Franklin Cover playing her father, Thomas, Tom Willis, and Roxy Roker as her mother, Helen. The Willis family also had a son, Alan, a white-passing college dropout, first played by Andrew Rubin, and then Jay Hammer. Fun fact, according to his memoir, Norman Lear prepared Roxy for the idea of playing one half of an interracial couple by sitting her down and explaining the relationship. He assured her that it would be as real as any other on TV. However, he also warned her that she would likely encounter some resistance from audiences. He needn't have bothered though. As soon as he mentioned it, she produced her wedding photo. The groom was Seymour Kravitz, a white Jewish man. He and Roxy had married in 1962 and went on to have one child, a son named Leonard, better known today as singer, songwriter, and actor Lenny Kravitz, before divorcing in 1985. In 1975, Norman was possibly the most powerful man working in television. So naturally, he had the ability to do things other showrunners couldn't. He used that power to push the envelope, including depicting the first recurring interracial marriage. But just because he could push those characters and storylines onto the screen didn't mean everyone was happy about it. In fact, in a contemporary review by the New York Daily News, a scene in which Tom and Helen Willis engage in a long, tender kiss is explicitly noted for being unusual because they are an interracial couple. Network executives weren't happy about taking things that far and pressured the producers to remove the scene. Apparently, they were worried that depicting an interracial kiss would lead to violence and worse, to affiliate stations dropping the show. Luckily, producer and future network president, Fred Silverman, fought to keep the scene in. I beg your pardon, I'll uh, come back later. <laughs> the viewers who didn't like it though, still let their feelings be known. We did get some hate mail. Frankly, she showed me the letters, you know those letters the people write, they clip the words out of like a magazine and out of a newspaper. So all the words are different shapes and sizes. One of those crazy looking letters, you know, some maniac just sat out all, but they had nothing else to do but send this crazy letter. In fact, TV Guide did a cover of us, uh, Roxy and Sherman and Isabel and myself, and somebody sent a copy of it with my face black, yeah, you know, out, which was really a compliment. <laughs> well, you know, you can't please all the people all the time. <laughs> Fun fact, while the show did use racial epithets for both black and white characters fairly often in early seasons, Sherman got tired of it as time went on. He thought his characters should be evolving and stop using such expressions. When his requests for change were ignored, he began deliberately flubbing his lines or saying the offensive words too low for the microphones to pick up, forcing the producers to reshoot scenes again and again. Eventually, this tactic worked and the writers stopped using the terms. Other main characters included the Jefferson's housekeeper, Florence Johnston, played by Marla Gibbs. She was tough, wisecracking, devoutly religious, and loved to tease George about his short stature and receding hairline. Fun fact, Florence was only supposed to be a bit part, but since audiences loved her so much, the character was promoted to full-time status. Marla, though, knew how quickly fortunes turned in Hollywood, so she opted to keep her job at United Airlines, where she'd been for over a decade, for two more years, not wanting to give up a good job for an acting role that might disappear at any moment. She says that she worked out an adjusted schedule with United that allowed her enough time to film her scenes and then race into work, where she worked the phones in the reservations office. Eccentric British next door neighbor, Harry Bentley, played by Paul Benedict, worked as an interpreter at the United Nations. He was often subjected to George slamming the door in his face during the telling of one of his stories, which George found to be boring. And George's mother, Olivia Mother Jefferson, played by Zara Cully, who constantly disparaged her daughter-in-law. Fun fact, Mike Evans' disappearance after the first season was not his idea. 
According to Jimmy Walker, who played JJ on Good Times, which Mike has credit as co-creator, he made it clear to Norman Lear that he deserved more screen time than Sherman and Isabel, who he saw as cast members on his show. He even threatened to walk if his wishes weren't fulfilled. Norman was unfazed and opted to deal with the problem by firing him. Another actor, Damon Evans, no relation, took over the role until 1979, when Mike returned and remained a regular through 1981, though he appeared sporadically until the end of the series. The series had one spin-off titled Checking In. It was centered on Florence, who takes a job as cleaning management at a hotel. It only lasted four episodes, though, after which Florence returned to the Jeffersons with the story that the hotel had burned down. Oddly, the show changed time slots at least 15 different times during its 11th season run, which is quite unusual for a popular long-running series. Normally, successful shows are allowed to develop in a specific time slot in order to become an anchor for the network. But for some reason, The Jeffersons was moved around constantly, forcing viewers to seek it out and figure out how to rearrange their viewing schedules to accommodate it. Even though the show consistently placed high in the ratings for the majority of its run, it never really received the recognition it deserved. While The Jeffersons secured over a dozen Emmy Award nominations, the show only won two. One for Isabel in 1981 for Best Actress in a Comedy Series, making her the first African-American actress to do so, and one for editing. In 1999, Sherman told Entertainment Weekly his theory as to why the series was overlooked by the TV industry. There were a lot of big name people on shows then, Donnie and Marie, Sonny and Cher, and we were unknowns. We were a show that beat everybody out, and I don't think they appreciated it too much. The Jeffersons ended in controversy after CBS abruptly canceled the series without allowing for a proper series finale. The cast wasn't even given the courtesy of a phone call to inform them of the news. Not surprisingly, they were angry and hurt. Yeah, it was a shock, definitely a shock, because we, it was, everything was going fine. I mean, they, we left our series next season, da, 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 da. and then boom. I didn't know I was canceled until my cousin called me from New York and said, I understand the Jeffersons has been canceled. I said, who told you that? He said, it's in the trades. In the trades, we are canceled? I just found out in the newspaper, you know, looking through the thing. When are we going back? When are we going back? We're not going back. You know? <laughs> I heard about it on uh, Entertainment Tonight. You know, it was just weird. We were still in the top 10. What can you do? There's nothing you can do. You just feel like you've been kicked in the stomach, you know? It's just like, whoa. And now, uh, you know. The rugs been pulled out from underneath us. That's it. Sony Pictures Home Entertainment released the first six seasons of The Jeffersons on DVD in North America between 2002 and 2007. After Shout Factory acquired the rights to the series in the summer of 2014, they subsequently released the complete series on DVD in a 33-disc collection at the end of that same year. As of the making of this video, 74-year-old Berlinda Tolbert and 92-year-old Marla Gibbs serve as the longest-running main cast members still alive. 78-year-old Jay Hammer is alive and well, as well, even though he was only on the show for one season. Fun fact, Lionel number two, Damon Evans, is also still around at 73, but he probably wouldn't care if he was included on this list or not, since, according to HeraldWeekly.com, he didn't enjoy his time on the show at all. Damon wasn't really into playing a sitcom character, and many times he would just not show up on set. He ended up leaving the series to get back to his theater career. Roxy Roker died in LA on December 2nd, 1995 of breast cancer. She was 66 years old. Sadly, Zara Cully passed away during the course of the show. She became very sick during the third season and could no longer participate on a consistent basis. She did return in the fourth season, but unfortunately became sick again and passed away on February 28, 1978 in Los Angeles at the age of 86. Isabel Sanford died on July 9, 2004 in LA. While her publicist attributed her death to unspecified natural causes, she had undergone preventative surgery on her carotid artery the previous September. In the ensuing months, her health steadily declined. She was 86 years old. Franklin Cover passed away at the Lillian Booth Actors Home, an assisted living facility in Inglewood, New Jersey on February 5, 2006. 
He'd been living there since the previous December while recovering from a heart condition and died of pneumonia. He was 77 years old. Mike Evans also passed away that same year on December 14th after a battle with throat cancer at his mother's home in 29 Palms, California. He was 57 years old. Paul Benedict died on December 1st, 2008 of a brain hemorrhage at his home in Aquina, Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. He was 70 years old. And Sherman Hemsley passed away on July 24th, 2012 at his home in El Paso, Texas due to superior vena cava syndrome, a complication associated with lung and bronchial carcinomas. Since he never married and had no children, a friend and business partner of his for over two decades became the sole beneficiary of his will. He was 74 years old. The Jeffersons was more than just a funny show. Not only was its portrayal of a well-to-do African-American family groundbreaking, but the scripts were unafraid to raise issues of race and class in a way that could never be done today. Norman Lear himself summed up the reason why perfectly. There's a degree of political correctness now that chokes the humor. But how did he get away with it? Well, it was all due to his power in the industry and an amazing track record. We were successful and nobody f***s with success. Oh, 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 oh,